to my channel my name is Isis and this is Isis says hi so first off I want to say happy women's history month I'm excited to talk about women and to get more into women's history today we're going to talk about mom bet or Elizabeth Freeman she was the first african-american woman to successfully file a lawsuit for freedom more specifically in the state of Massachusetts and then this case was the beginning of a lot of freedom suits that would ultimately lead to Massachusetts, particularly the Supreme Court, to outlawing or banning slavery within the state of Massachusetts. Elizabeth Freeman was most likely born in 1742 to enslaved African parents in Claverack or Claverick? I don't know. <laughs> upstate New York I'm pretty sure and she grew up on the plantation of Peter Hajboom with her younger sister Lizzie. When Hajboom's daughter married Colonel John Ashley he gave Bet and her sister to the new couple. Some people say that it was Bet and her daughter she's known as Mom Bet in this point but some people say it was Bet and her daughter some people say it was her sister and then as we've seen unless you get a very detailed autobiography from somebody like Josiah Henson. You're not gonna get a specific kind of birth date of folks who were born as slaves, of black folks who were born as slaves. So it's pretty frustrating, particularly because I believe Harriet Tubman was an, is another person who there isn't a specific birth date and she's done so much. And so that's kind of like a frustrating part. So she became the Ashley slave and she was their slave until about, until she was about 40. And by that time she was known as Mum Bet and she had a young daughter called Little Bet. And so some people say that her husband is unknown and then other people say that her husband went to fight in the Revolutionary War but was killed. Tradition has it that John Ashley, one of the most prominent and respected men in Western Massachusetts, treated his enslaved men and women well. His wife, on the other hand, was described as a shrew untamable. One day, she attempted to strike Bet's sister with a heated kitchen shovel. Bet protected her sister by blocking Mrs. Ashley's strike, but received a serious wound on her arm that never healed. Instead of covering her arm, she left her wound visible as evidence of her mistreatment. Furious, she left the house and refused to return. So this section is also a little conflicted. Some stories say it was her daughter that was hit. Some s stories say that it was her sister. Other stories also say that it was her head. Some say it was her arm. Either way, somebody who was close to her was striked. She blocked that hit, received a wound, and she never hit that wound. She kind of did it to show when she was mistreated at that establishment at that home and two slavery sucks <laughs> and that was one of the reasons to kind of bring it back before this incident colonel ashley was a strong supporter of the american revolution and he claimed to have the largest farm in town and his wealth was built in large measure on the backs of the small group of enslaved people he owned around him though the world was changing and as the American colonies staked out their independence, the abolitionist movement began to gain some headwind in Massachusetts. Even as early as the 1700s, the Puritan judge Samuel Sewall, who was involved in prosecuting in the Salem Witch Trials, wrote a piece called The Selling of Joseph that called into question the practice of owning other human beings. In 1773, Boston Black people organized a petition against slavery. It was turned down, but just seven years later, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts completed its constitution, the first state in the Union to do so. In it was the guarantee that all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights. Colonel Ashley was a wealthy citizen of Sheffield, Massachusetts. He served as the judge of the Berkshire Court of Common Pleas. He controlled the local committee that wrote the Sheffield Declaration. This declaration was approved on January 12th, 1773. It stated that mankind in a state of nature are equal, free, and independent of each other, 
and have a right to the undisturbed enjoyment of their lives, their liberty, and property. This wording was also used in the United States Declaration of Independence of 1776 and the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. Miss Bett overheard these ideas when Colonel Ashley held events in his home and when the documents were read aloud in the public square. She decided that if all people were born free and equal, then the laws must apply to her too. When Colonel Ashley called on the law for her return, she called on Theodore Sedgwick, a lawyer from Stockbridge who had anti-slavery sentiments and was looking to mount a legal attack against the practice of slavery and asked for his help to sue for her freedom. Years later, he told his daughter, daughter Catherine, that Mum Bet believed that she had a case based on the newly ratified Massachusetts Constitution. When he asked how she knew of this, she is said to have replied by keeping still and minding things, which I think is probably one of my favorite things that I've ever heard. Theodore Sedgwick was a prominent attorney who helped draft the Sheffield Decla Declaration with Colonel Ashley along with him. And Miss Bett, along with an enslaved man named Brom, began the process of fighting for their freedom. Cedric would later say that there was nothing submissive or subdued about Mum Bett's character, but because women had such limited legal rights, the lawyers had decided to add a male, Brom, they decided to add him to the lawsuit. Cedric, along with many of the lawyers in the area, decided to use that case as kind of like a test case to determine if slavery was constitutional under the Massachusetts Constitution. So constitutional means, does this abide by this thing of laws that we just made? So is it constitutional or is it unconstitutional? So does it not abide by the law? In May of 1781, Cedric and his team filed a document with the Berkshire Court of Common Pleas. This document ordered Colonel Ashley to release Bet and Brom. And the Berkshire Court stated that Bet and Brom were not Colonel Ashley's legitimate property. But Colonel Ashley refused to release them. I think one of the funniest things is literally his co-workers pretty much just like <laughs> said, no girl. <laughs> because Colonel Ashley was a judge at the Berkshire Court. And I feel like that's part of why he refused to release them because he was pretty angry. By August in 1781, the case went to the county court. So now it's no longer a local, it's on a, on a more higher level, to the common pleas of Great Barrington. The jury ruled in favor of Bet and Brom again, making them the first enslaved African Americans to be freed under the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, and ordered Ashley to pay them 30 shillings and pay six pounds in court costs which I will convert to what that would look like now. Colonel Ashley filed an appeal to the Supreme Judicial Court, the state Supreme Court, and he dropped the case a few months later. But this case is what helped to set a standard for the Quack Walker case and ultimately led to the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So Quack Walker, he was a slave and he was promised by his original owner and his wife that he would be freed at 25. That original owner died, but the wife agreed, the wife remarried, but agreed saying, yeah, you're gonna be released at 25. She dies at 19. And so when Kwok turns 25, expecting to be freed because his two previous owners said he would be freed at 25, this new, the husband said no. And Kwok, I think three years later ran away. The new husband's, him and his friends went and found him and severely beat him. So Kwok took him to court for assault and battery, if I'm not mistaken. I was gonna put it in here, but then I was like, I feel like that doesn't fully apply to mum bet and I just don't think it'll make sense. After the ruling, despite pleas from Colonel Ashley for her to return and work with pay, Mum Bet went to work for the Sedgwicks. She stayed with them as their paid housekeeper until the children were grown, and later she bought land and became a well-known and prominent nurse and midwife. This is where she changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman, so now I'm going to call her Miss Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth Mum Bet Freeman died on December 28th, 1829 surrounded by her children and grandchildren. She was buried in the Sedgwick family plot in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, 
and she is believed to have been 85 years old and is the only non-Sedgwick buried in the inner circle of the Sedgwick plant family plot. <laughs> One of her great-grandchildren was W.E.B. Du Bois, who I'll put right here, but most people know, and he was born about 40 years later in Great Barrington, the very town where her case was argued. Her tombstone reads, she was born a slave and remained a slave for nearly 30 years. She could neither read nor write, yet in her own sphere, she had no superior or equal. She neither wasted time nor property. She never violated a trust nor failed to perform a duty. In every situation of domestic trial, she was the most efficient helper and the tenderest friend. Good mother, farewell. That is her story. That's Miss Mumbet's story. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy. And guess what? I finally finished the Biden stuff. So I'm going to start with January's executive orders. I know February and coming into March, he's probably changed some stuff. So I'm going to be updating y'all on that along with the regular research videos as well. So I hope you enjoy the double content. And yeah, I'll see you next week. Bye. I don't know why I do the peace sign. Whatever. Bye.